and that is the impact that psychopathy, uh, the, the, this, this severe, um, I don't know if you, I, I, I guess you would call it a mental illness, um, but this, this severe condition that roughly 1% of, of humans have, where they don't feel other people's pain, essentially. They, they lack empathy. And they're willing to just crush anybody who gets in their way. Th these are the people who arguably brought us civilization. Right? I think I, you know, so I, I, I realize there are, there are those who argue that there's an upside to psychopathy because, you know, hey, while it's 1% of our population, it's 20% of our CEOs. I think, frankly, the difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party right now is that the, the Republican Party, which was headed by a psychopath for four years, Donald Trump, and I don't, I, I, I think we can easily back that statement up. Uh, uh, psychiatrist and professor of psychiatry at George Washington University uh, Medical School, Dr. Justin Frank, on this program has just come right out and said it, uh, as have several other psychologists on this program. So the Republican Party has kind of reinvented itself in the psychopathic model, whereas the Democratic Party, and, and by the way, that would account for why the Republicans play brutal politics, take no prisoners politics. I mean, just look at Mitch McConnell. That is psychopathy. And then on the other hand, you look at the Democrats. Well, let's compromise. Let's work things out. Let's collab collaborate. Let's cooperate. That's how normal people are. That's how non-psychopaths are. You know, I, in, in the, the piece on this that I, that I wrote for HarbinReport.com today, I, I, I talked about how decades ago when I was doing international relief work for the Salem International Organization, um, I was in this little town in northern Australia called Lockhart River. It's an aboriginal town. Um, uh, as I recall, it was like, you know, 500 or 1,000 people. And they had a little school. And uh, there was this one teacher who was giving me a tour. He was uh, relatively new to the place. He'd been there about a year. He was a white guy who'd grown up in Sydney. And uh, he, he was so eager to tell me about this amazing, life-changing experience he had when he first got to the school. And what it was was that uh, he was, you know, uh, kind of supervising after-school activities, and the kids were playing soccer, and they had formed into two teams. And they would go back and forth and back and forth in terms of which team was ahead. And then after about an hour, at some point, they just stopped playing and told him the game was over. And he was like, Why? How do you know? I mean, you know, what's the, I don't see any specific thing that tells me the game is over. And they were like, well, both, both teams have the same score. We're even. And he was like, whoa, this is incredible. I, you know, I, I, I had been uh, working in, in Petford, in fact, uh, with another guy up there um, who was Aboriginal. Uh, Jeff Guest was his name. And, but, but in any case, I'm, 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 digressing slightly here, but the point is that that value system of we're all equal, we're all in this together, we're all part of this, we look out for each other, we've got each other's backs, that value system is what the 99% of humanity who aren't psychopaths hold. And the I got mine, screw you, that's the 1% of psychopaths. And here's where it gets really interesting. Over on Bloomberg News today, piece by Peter Coy, the headline, the bottom 90% of Americans are borrowing from the top 1%. This is from a, a paper that was just published titled Indebted Demand by uh, uh, economists from Princeton, Harvard, and the University of Chicago. And in econ speak, this is what they said, quote, this is from their paper, a substantial amount of borrowing by households in the bottom 90% of the wealth distribution was financed through the accumulation of financial assets by the top 1%. Right. And so, you know, then the question is, like, when did the psychopaths take over? Well, Daniel Quinn, I think, probably offers us the best answer to that question in his uh, book Ishmael, where he su suggests that, and I, I quote him, and I cite this in... Uh, uh, at least two of my books, I, The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, mostly, 
where you know he pointed out that prior to the agricultural revolution, he, his phrase was, we all lived in the hands of God. In other words, we lived on a day-to-day -day basis, hunting gatherers, hunter gatherers. But as we moved into climates, we, the human race, moved into climates that were seasonal, moved away from the equator, and developed agriculture, and this hit its peak around 7,000 years ago, it became possible for some people to lock up the food. And whoever locked up the food now controlled the power of life and death over all the people who didn't have the food locked up. They didn't have access to it. And those people who locked up the food 7,000 years ago became what today we refer to as kings or queens or CEOs or, you know, robber barons. And here's where it gets really fascinating. There, there, what, what got me thinking about this and started on this was a headline I saw in Drudge yesterday, of all places. And it was a link to uh, an article about how, the, from a gaming site, about how, and it was about game night, people having game nights in their homes and, uh, or online. And that the game that causes the most strife the game that is the most banned in America, because it literally, uh, according to them, 11% of the time can lead to a fist fight, is Monopoly. And Monopoly, of course, you know, was invented back in 1903 by Lizzie Maggie. Uh, she patented it in 1903, or at least what the precursor to Monopoly, the game that eventually became Monopoly, as a warning against unrestrained, unregulated capitalism. Monopoly is a warning, right? the game. It's a way of telling you this is how capitalism works if it's not regulated. Somebody ends up with everything and everybody else ends up with nothing. I mean, that's the goal of Monopoly, right? In a recent survey of 2,000 U.S. residents, 20% say their game nights with family or friends are often or always disrupted by competitive or unfriendly behavior. Monopoly stands out as the most debated and most forbidden board game of all time. The so-called good news is that, quote, only 11% of respondents say they witnessed a physical fight breakout, end quote. Now, I'm not saying you should ban Monopoly. It's a great, you know, warning. But, you know, the lesson from Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, and the 99% of us who are not psychopaths, is that we'll all be better off if we can clean up our business culture and our political culture to purge them of psychopaths. Now, how do we do this? Well, we need to strengthen our democracy by giving an absolute right to vote to all Americans. That's H.R. 1, the For the People Act. And we need to get corporate and billionaire money out of politics. That's also H.R. 1. And then we need to start breaking up actual monopolies. I mean, the real monopolies.